Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, and if we run into something from the future, we'll let you know. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and writer about music and musicians for The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, Beatle fan, and fine publications everywhere. I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, uh, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hey, everybody. And I should also mention the podcast Talk More Talk, which Ken is a quarter of the mm-hmm. hosts for. And we have Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV-FM 90.7 in the New York area since 1984. I mean, they were 90.7 probably before that, but Darren's been there since 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. And I think in the past week or so, Darren has returned to work after his leg injury, which you've heard about here. So how did that go, Darren? Fine. Uh, today went fine. I'm not on the air yet. That I'll return to my air shift uh, on uh, the 26th. So by the time some folks listen maybe to this for the first time, I'll be back on the air. But on Monday night, the 26th, 10 p.m., I returned to my uh, regular air shifts after being, other than not counting the Woodstock specials, which we'll talk about. Hey, yeah, I was going to say, people might be confused because they'll have just it's, heard you <laughs> talking yeah, about Yeah, it, it's been uh, the first few days of May was the last time I was on. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, howdy to everyone. Okay, so today, at, eventually, we will get to a discussion proposed by one of our listeners um, about the differences between Ringo as produced by Mark Hudson and Ringo post-Mark Hudson. But before we get to that, we have some news. And Ken, would you like to start off? Sure. Uh, we'll start by bringing up uh, Mojo Magazine because they are putting out a special 50th anniversary commemorative issue for the Beatles Abbey Road album. This will be for their October issue. And um, this extra special package will have a Beatles exclusive. It's a uh, lovingly crafted double-sided Beatles map. One side featuring Beatles sites in Liverpool. The other has Beatles sites in London. There's also an unusual collector's cover featuring artwork from Paul McCartney and a CD of the year's best new music. And the cover story is Abbey Road, a 50th anniversary guide to the Beatles' last masterpiece, plus the exclusive inside track on Apple's expanded remix new edition. And um, the on-sale date is August the 20th. So that's actually this week. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the Abbey Road album, Ken Womack's new book, is on that very subject. It's called Solid State, the story of Abbey Road and the end of the Beatles. It includes a foreword from Alan Parsons, who Mm -hmm. co-engineered the album. Parsons described the book as impeccably researched. He says Solid State is an accurate history, not only of the characters and personnel involved in the Beatles' final album, including myself, I'm pleased to add, but also digs deeper behind the scenes into the technical aspects of the recording equipment, and the musical instruments used by the Fab Four in the production of this timeless album. You will become aware of many hitherto unknown facts about the making of Abbey Road and the events that led to the eventual demise of the greatest rock band that ever was. And uh, we can expect this book out October the 15th. All right. Mm -hmm. Another new book uh, coming out, but not till next year, comes from Patty Boyd. And it's called My Life Through a Lens. It's being described as an extraordinary visual memoir. and will include drawings, paintings, and mementos, and her own memories of her life filled with pop culture icons. And the book is due out from Simon & Schuster, and that will be next April, when we can expect that. Uh, Lots of news about Ringo Starr, and we're going to be talking about his uh, recent shows in this area, Darren and myself. He continues with his all-star band, 
and his tour of uh, North America. There was a short video that leaked out on the internet at the time of Ringo's first concert from this tour, which was in Windsor, Canada, with him playing the bongos. I don't know if you saw this or not. And this is, yeah, with uh, Steve Lukather and uh, Greg Bissonette and Gary Astridge, who's a drumming and Ringo expert. And they're singing along to the George Harrison Beatles song, I Need You. Hmm. It's very cool to hear Ringo playing the uh, bongos for that. It's only about 30, 40 seconds. But uh, when you ever see Ringo now, you know, playing along with I Need You mm-hmm. <laughs> with uh, these great musicians. Also, some very special guests who have popped up on stage during Ringo's tour include Amy Lou Harris and Gary Burr. And that was at the second of two shows at the famous Ryman Theater in Nashville. And also at Pier 17 in New York City, which Darren went to. And uh, Ringo was joined by Mark Rivera and Billy Amendola from Modern Drummer Magazine. And uh, I know you're going to be talking about that in a few minutes, Darren. Uh huh. Uh, more on Ringo. He makes a guest appearance on the new album from country star Rodney Crowell. Ringo drums on the song. I love this title. You're only happy when you're miserable. <laughs> it's on Rodney's new album, which is called Texas. And uh, don't forget the new tribute single to former Wings lead guitarist, the late Henry McCullough called Long Live Rock and Roll, is now out digitally. It features Paul on bass guitar and also boasts Gary Brooker on lead vocals, Nick Mason, Albert Lee, Chris Staten, Paul Carrick, and Paul Brady. And the song is available to listen to right now on YouTube. You can actually listen to the Henry McCullough tribute song, Long Live Rock and Roll. You can listen to the Roddy Crowell song, You're Only Happy When You're Miserable, with Ringo on drums. They're both on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. A few it's other a, things. What's that? That Henry McCullough song's a uh, tribute song's a great song. You've heard it. Yes. And okay. it's going to be on an album that I think is a uh, Henry McCullough compilation album with this one song that you were talking about, which they um, the band kind of calls themselves like, something to the effect of Henry McCullough's Fusiliers. I think I, I'll look it up. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. So move on, and I'll. Uh, Check this out. I should have wrote it down, but hey. Okay. Uh, Paul McCartney will be making a rare appearance, reading his new children's book called Hey Grand Dude, and doing a book signing at the Piccadilly branch of London's Waterstones Bookstore. That'll be on September the 6th at 4 p.m. He'll be appearing with the illustrator for the book, Catherine Durst. And as it is described on Paul's website, Hey Grand Dude, is about a super cool granddad who takes his grandchildren on a whirlwind magical mystery tour from tropical seas to alpine mountains all before bedtime. (laughs) All right. Some Um, um, pretty specific rules about how to get into that um, reading and signing, right? uh, Have you read about that? No. Well, you're allowed to bring, I believe, one child... But it's, I mean, it's, there's... there's, Does it have to be your own? um, It doesn't necessarily have to be your own, um, but it's... Any uh, child will do. Yeah, I can't can't remember all the details because, you know, I'm not actually going, but I just sort of read through them once and uh, it it just seemed like, wow, it's an awful lot of rules on this one, you know, about, uh, you know, when you can start standing on line, when you can't start standing on line. It's, you know, really a lot of detail. Hmm. And And there's only one autograph per, I guess, per party, you know. Right. And only that book, of course. But that's not unusual, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So Um, you could grab any kid out on the street and before the uh, authorities come, (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah. Run in and get the autograph and then go. Um, you know, you know, you don't have to have a kid with you. You could just oh. go on your own, Darren. And <laughs> Somebody may want to bring me and I could qualify as the kid. Um, possibly, but I have a feeling that they gave, um, I think they said something like under 13 or 14 or something like that. My wife. Yeah. The rules my must wife, be out I there on the internet bundle. somewhere. So um, it, it's probably on Paul's website. Probably, yeah. Yeah. I, I knew I saw them somewhere. <laughs> it could be there. Also, uh, the movie that's gotten a lot of attention for Beatle fans called Yesterday 
will officially be coming out first on digital HD on September the 10th, followed by the film's release on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray, and DVD on September 24th. And uh, as we've discussed here on this show, uh, this is a film about a guy played by Himish Patel, who's a musician and a big Beatles fan who wakes up in a world where the Beatles never existed. He's in an alternate universe. And uh, this new release will boast a ton of bonus material, including an alternate opening, an alternate ending, 12 deleted scenes that offer a look at what was left on the cutting room floor. Live performances of Himish playing yesterday, I Want to Hold Your Hand and Let It Be at Abbey Road Studios, mm-hmm. plus featurettes focused on Ed Sheeran, Kate McKinnon, and the relationship between director Danny Boyle and screenwriter Richard Curtis. And the home video will even have an audio commentary track from both Boyle and Curtis. Quite a lot packed in there. That's so true. for people that love this movie, <laughs> they're giving you so much bonus material. And um, let's see. The final thing I have to say is a very happy birthday goes out to Billy J. Kramer, who, as we are recording this show on August the 19th, turns 76 years young. God bless him. So happy birthday, Billy. Hey, happy birthday. And that's all the news. That's Ono news that I have for you right now. Cute. (laughs) And... I have that Henry McCullough info. The album uh, is called uh, Bally Wonderland, and it's a 15-track album. I'm assuming that the 14 songs, and I do recognize some of the titles, 14 of the songs are Henry McCullough tunes, so it's, I guess, kind of a, a best of. And then right in the middle of the album, the fifth, fifth track, actually, is Long Live Rock and Roll, which is that old star tribute that you were just talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Bally Wonderland. Uh, I think the CD physically is out this Friday. Okay. okay. So the the album is called Bally Wonderland. Bally Wonderland, one word. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Okay, so both of you went to Ringo shows uh, within, I think, the past week. Um, so why don't we, uh, you know, debrief you on those? Um, Ken, wh- where did you go? I got to see Ringo and Bethel mm-hmm. at the Bethel Woods Art Center, and I also saw him in Farmingville, Long Island. And uh, they were both tremendous shows, but I have to admit, having never been to Bethel at the site where Woodstock actually took place, it's really emotional just to be there, just to be a part of it. And, um, you know, the concert was phenomenal. All of his shows always are. Mm-hmm. And the lineup of the musicians, it's uh, there's a few changes in the lineup by having ha- uh, Hamish Stewart in the group from the Average White Band, also in Paul McCartney's band, mm-hmm. as we know, in the late 80s and early 90s, and Colin Hay from Men at Work. And um, the band played phenomenally well at both shows. There's something, I don't know what it is. On the one hand, I would love for Ringo to shake up the list of musicians in, in his band. But at the same time, I could never get enough of watching Steve Lukather play lead guitar. He is just smoking. You know, I love anything that he plays on the guitar. He brings so much excitement to every song when he plays lead. And I love to hear Greg Raleigh play. And no matter how many years uh, those two have been part of the all-star band, I think it's seven years now, and they play virtually the same songs, they still generate so much excitement out of the audience. The Santana songs go over so well. The Toto songs go over so well. And I was very pleased to see how well Colin Hayes' songs was greeted by the fans. When I saw the show in Farmingville in particular, uh, one of my favorite songs of the 80s, period, let alone this show, is the song Overkill from Men at Work. Mm -hmm. It's a song that you don't really get to hear that much being played on the radio when compared to Who Could It Be Now and Down Under. And as soon as the band went right into the song Overkill, there's so many people in the audience that went, oh... Like they were so happy to hear the song. And I felt so good about that because you never know. I, I spend a lot of time now watching the audience, their reaction to certain songs, the different age groups that are there. Because It's a great feeling to know this is very much a family type show and you get parents bringing their kids to these concerts. So some of them, especially the young ones, probably the parents are bringing them up on the Beatles stuff. They may not know 80s music. They may not know Men at Work. 
And even the average white band stuff, you can't just assume everybody knows it. It's kind of hard for me to, to, to imagine anyone not knowing pick up the pieces. But if you didn't grow up in that time period, you might not know those songs. And Cut the Cake, which was another average white band song that made the top ten here. But I think the crowd was very respectful to Hamish Stewart stuff, but they really loved Colin Hayes' music. And Ringo is Ringo. Everybody loves him on stage. He's so relaxed when he does his ad-libbing, although a lot of it is pretty much the same shtick from show to show. If you go to two shows in a row, he says some of the same things, but he also ad-libs a bit. But they're always great performances. And, um, you know, no matter what, I always find people who have gone to these shows for the first time I was sitting next to a woman who I think was probably in her late 30s, early 40s, and she had never been to any Ringo show. And she was loving every single song and standing up, <laughs> you know, for practically every song there. And she was so thrilled when Steve Lukather went in to hold the line. And she was thinking, no, he's not going to do that one, is he? And she was so thrilled as soon as the, the band cranked it up on that song. So just to see the reaction of the crowd, that's part of the reason why I enjoy going to these shows. And, you know, even though I'd love to see a, a different set list and, and shake it up with uh, all the different musicians and try to get some new people that have never been in the All-Stars before, somehow this never gets old. You know, I could see these shows every single year as I have ever since he toured, started touring 30 years ago. And uh, I never get tired of these shows at all. They're really enjoyable. And I especially love to watch Ringo drumming to see how happy he is and to see to see that, um, you know, a lot of his drumming looks very interesting and to see how it coordinates with Greg Bissonette, double drumming. I think he was very lively on the drums, Ringo. But I, I had such a great time for both these shows. But. I'll talk about the whole Woodstock experience a little bit later on. But just as shows go, you know, it's it's always an enjoyable show. You can never leave disappointed. The only people who could be disappointed are the, the people who know Ringo's full catalog and wish he'd do other material than the same songs. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I should point out, the show in Bethel was actually a shorter show because there were four songs that were left out of the concert in Bethel. And usually... Well, that, that also happened because there were two opening acts. You had Blood, Sweat, and Tears. You had Edgar Winter. And mm -hmm. they were both great. But it was nice to see that they had Blood, Sweat, and Tears there because they played at Woodstock 50 years ago. Although they have a brand new lead singer in the group who actually sang really well. And Edgar Winter, his brother Johnny, was there at Woodstock. And Edgar played with them there. So those are two acts who were there at Woodstock 50 years ago on the same bill. So Edgar and, Winter didn't play with Ringo. No, he didn't. And the big surprise to me is that um, you would think that Edgar being there that night, usually whenever there's special guests that come out on stage, it's always for the last song with a little help of my friends. I thought Edgar would be there, and he wasn't. So that surprised me a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Darren, what were your experiences? A lot of the same thing, of course, that, uh, of what Ken said. I saw Ringo on Sunday night, uh, the 18th of August, and uh, at a venue which is fairly new in New York City. I don't exactly know when they uh, opened the doors to this place, but it's the old, uh, it's an old, P old Pier 17 at South Street Seaport, totally renovated, and they used the rooftop as a, a concert venue. And uh, so that's where Ringo was last night. I thought, just to get uh, just a, a little bit of a sidebar, kind of interesting, these two venues that Ringo played for the two New York City area shows that he would play not in Westbury or not in a, a, a Long Island venue that, it, that pops to mind immediately, but in Farmingville. And what is the, uh, the name of it, Ken? Um, it's, I'll, I'll look it up. It's an Something amphitheater. Something or another at Bald Hill, and it had another name. It was um, like a, a um, uh, commercial. There it is. I got it. Long Island Hospital Amphitheater. Okay. I'd never heard of it. Didn't know there was a concert venue in Farmingville, and yet a former Beatles playing there. And the same thing with, the at the same time, the New York City date at the rooftop at Pier 17. That got a huh out of me when I, when I heard that. Uh, but... 
It's a really cool venue, pier17ny.com is the website, and it's a very flashy website, and you get a sense of uh, how picturesque the venue is. Uh, if you've been to uh, the South Street Seaport, and if you've been to that Pier 17, it used to be like a mall, small mall, uh, and um, I think they had like a, an Applebee's-type restaurant in there. They've totally renovated that. Probably now it's been a couple of years because I haven't been down there in a while. Uh, and that, that whole building's been renovated, very colorful. And on the roof is the venue. It holds uh, about 2,400 people. And um, the stage is open. You could see through the back. In other words, behind the stage is not closed off. So if you're sitting in the audience, and of course, if you're at the show, I'd like to believe that you would be sitting in the audience, uh, and you're looking at the stage, you could see the Brooklyn Bridge right through, uh, which is behind the uh, the pier. And uh, it's a really very, very classy and uh, very New York venue. Only it's a nightmare getting in and out because it's just a handful of escalators getting people up to the roof. And I was having problems with my uh, bad wheel uh, getting around. But it was well worth it. Ringo was in, uh, as you said, Ken, he was in uh, top form. He was very happy. He was very, uh, very jovial, hopping around. I'm looking at him up there, and I got my, my cane, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, he's 79? Mm hmm Okay. He moves 10 times better than I do now when I'm 54. Um, he comes running out on stage. He's got the jumping jacks at the end of the show, which I always get a kick out of. He seemed really, really happy and in a good mood. He seemed at slightly more playful than I remember him being in recent shows. And while, yes, uh, some of it is scripted, I detected a lot of stuff that he was just what had popped ever popped into his head he was saying. Mm -hmm. So he was coming out with some funny stuff. I, I thought his voice might have occasionally, I thought I heard some hoarseness yep. uh, towards the end. I also detected um, Steve Lukather, who's a guitarist first and a singer second. Mm -hmm. um, I thought his voice, I, I mean, could possibly even with Greg Raleigh, I think maybe as they've been touring now and playing so many shows, especially in a short period of time, they may have been a little tired, but it was very, that's a very, very minor point. Uh, Colin Hay sounds almost exactly as he did in the 80s. Right. Uh, Hamish Stewart, you could detect a little, a little age in his voice, but still, he was, and he was right in there. Perfect personality for the All-Star Band. The last time he was in the All-Star Band was more of a, a kind of an emergency fill-in type deal. Mm hmm If I remember correctly. Yeah. This was... Hamish Stewart is up front. He's going to do three average white band songs. The two that you, well, pick up the pieces, the title track to cut the cake and uh, another track from the AWB album. And I, um, work to do. Yeah. And that was, that was great. Mm -hmm. Um, tip of the cap to Warren Ham, because I really think he's grown into the role as, uh, kind of like the band leader sax player. I remember him being very, uh, laid back. I think the first tour, he did with Ringo when he first stepped in for Mark Rivera. Mm -hmm. uh, but he has, um, he's really coming to his own as a jack of all trades. And uh, a little trivia for you. Uh, I knew this, but kind of forgot about it. Those of you who remember the 70s rock band Blood Rock. Blood well, um, do you remember Blood Rock, Alan? Oh, yeah. Alan actually was the president of the New York uh, City chapter of the fan club for Blood Rock. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I don't Warren, think so. <laughs> uh, Warren Ham was uh, a member of Blood Rock, was their lead singer. I think their last two albums. And then what I didn't know, I was looking, I looked this up yesterday. When Kerry Livgren left Kansas, he formed a, a, a Christian rock band called A.D. And Warren Ham was, this, I think, the lead singer for them. Because I had never heard of him before. He came on board with Ringo, uh, Ringo's All-Star Band. But uh, Mark Rivera was there. He was a special guest. He was actually sitting right behind me. We spoke a few minutes before the show. And uh, so Mark came out and uh, low-key kind of was hovering in the back playing percussion. Uh, didn't play any sax or anything. Came out and sang. And then, as, uh, as Ken mentioned, Billy Amandola came out on uh, 
with a little help from my friends and was kind of just doing some light percussion. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it was, you know, you watch him and you're like, this guy's unreal, Ringo. He's just a he's just a specimen. And uh, I fully intend on uh, seeing him next year because with a new album that now we sort of know is coming out in the near future. I read something where Ringo said he's done with the new album. They're just working on cover art. Uh, I could see him doing a 2020 tour. Uh, but like Ken said, I am, you know, I love the band. I'm a massive Santana fan. So Greg Raleigh is one of my heroes. Uh, I always want to see Greg Raleigh there. But I sort of miss when every year the band would almost completely turn over and you'd get the Jack Bruce's and the Peter Framptons and the Greg Lakes and the Roger Hodgson's mm-hmm. and the Howard Jones's coming, you know, coming through. That was part of the, the thrill of it all, seeing yeah. the changes from year to year. But I'm glad you said what you did, Darren, about Warren Ham in particular, because he's like an unsung hero in this band. He really does fit every need that this band has. He plays so many different instruments, the saxophone, the flute, keyboards. And when it comes to the higher notes on the Toto stuff, like on Rosanna and Africa, right. that's when he helps Steve Lukather out. And he does right. a great job. He pretty much is doing what Mark Rivera did before. I mean, they, right. he really is the musical director of the band. And Greg Bissonette also deserves a lot of credit, too. He's a phenomenal drummer, and he's like the perfect fit for Ringo as a double drummer. He really is. And sometimes when he does, uh, when Ringo leaves the stage, which he will usually do for one song, or maybe in the case of In Farmingville, he left for two songs. Yeah. You'll see Greg Bissonette really shine when he drums behind Black Magic Woman for Greg Raleigh. I mean, he's just, ah, oh. <laughs> his drumming is all over the place. He's, it's just fantastic to watch him doing the solos that he does. So uh, they're both great, Greg and and, uh, and Warren Ham. Yeah, and um, also um, uh, Colin Hay uh, did part of the lead on one of the Toto songs, the high parts. I can't hmm. remember now which one of the two. Uh, either either Africa, or it might have been Rosanna, I don't remember. Uh, but, um, you know, because Steve, uh, he was a vocalist in Toto, but wasn't uh, the main guy, Bobby Kimball, in the point of, in, in the case of Rosanna in Africa, mm. who was the lead singer for those two songs. So, uh, Lukather needs a little help with the vocals there, so Warren Ham and Colin Hay are, uh, are both there. And they, like you said, it, uh, it worked really well. It was very enjoyable. And, uh, don't get me wrong, as much as some new members would be cool, I'll be there with bells on, not literally, but next tour, even if Greg Raleigh's back and Steve Lukather's back and, and so on and so forth. So um, those, two, those two have great chemistry together, Greg Raleigh yeah. and Steve Lukather. They really I don't know cool. how friendly they were before the All-Star Band, uh, before they joined. I'm sure their paths crossed often, but they seem like they're best friends on stage. And actually, I would love to see a Steve Lukather or Greg Raleigh album or something. It'd be terrific if they do something together as, you know, a duo. But, uh, yeah, it was the 30th anniversary. Uh, I didn't. I was surprised Ringo didn't play that up a little more. Uh, and I know that they have a 30th anniversary program uh, for sale, but I didn't see any merch anywhere at the, uh, uh, the rooftop at Pier 17. But uh, I was just a little surprised that Ringo didn't play up the 30th anniversary. I'm surprised, too. You know, it was kind of low-key. He never mentioned it. And maybe while I was watching the show, thinking, you know, there used to be, it almost seemed like there were too many All-Star Band live albums at one point. They were kind of all blending into one. It's Mm -hmm. been so long since there has been one. I was thinking, you know, this band, you know, the the raleigh Lukather lineups of of recent years really deserve like a double album, you know, kind of overview of the last... What is it, close to 10 years now? Almost, not quite. Well, the, la- the last live album, I think, was Live at the Greek Theater 2008, so it's been 11. Yeah. Well, there was also Live at the Ryman, which was a DVD. Okay. Right. Right? So I'm trying to remember what the last one was, the most recent that? one. Uh, I'll Google it as we speak. While Ken Googles, we'll now have a word from our sponsor. No, I'm just kidding. So yeah, uh, big thumbs up. No surprise. Ringo's uh, he's a, he's a, he defies age. Is that the right way mm-hmm. of putting it? So yeah, 
Yeah. The uh, the concert at the Ryman was in 2012. Okay. And that was a DVD, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So the last album was 2008. It's time. They should do like a collection that has, you know, a little Graham Goldman in there and uh, was uh, Wally Palmer part of the uh, – Gary Wright when Greg Raleigh and Steve Luca that were there? I don't no. remember now. No? No. It, it was with Todd Rundgren and Richard yeah. Page. Right, right. I think from the very beginning. Todd was always there from the start of the lineup with, with uh, Greg Raleigh and Steve Luca there. Right. So, yeah. So, um, there was one other topic we wanted to talk about before we moved on to the Mark Hudson debate, such as it is, and that was Woodstock itself, which, you know, Ken was just there at the uh, Bethel Center, and uh, it's just also been the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. And uh, Ken, you were, when we were talking before, you mentioned that there were actually quite a number of Beatles connections, uh, you know, people who played at Woodstock that... Um, went on to work with one of the Beatles. And uh, after that, I know an actual Beatles connection you might not have heard. Well, I mean, you could do a show just on this, because if you really take the time to study it, depends on how involved you want to go. I mean, obviously, Ravi Shankar was right. there at the, the 69 uh, at, at the festival. Um, Henry McCormick was in the Grease Band. Right. But there's actually one member of Ringo's All-Star Band right now that was there. 50 years ago Mm -hmm. and that was greg raleigh when he was well part of santana right and um yeah so uh there's so many others Um, i have one you guys don't know go ahead wait wait a second you could go through (laughs) the who what about the who (laughs) (laughs) not the one i'm thinking of okay but but all the members of the who (laughs) have worked with the beatles i know john fogarty did a concert in a club with George Harrison and Taj Mahal. Oh, that's right. Uh, l- let me think. <laughs> It'll come to me. We have some, which ones? We have some game show uh, music that we can play. Uh... <laughs> do you want to know? Uh, Alan, I... Alan will sing it. Alan will sing. <laughs> do, 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 All right, enough, enough, enough. That's good. That's good. Well, the one I have is um, Keith Hartley. Okay. Now, Keith. Keith Hartley, uh, for those who don't know, and probably many don't, because uh, unfortunately he's like one of these musicians that was uh, had a bit more of a following in England, and the impact he had on uh, you know on rock music was was in the second half of the '60s, early '70s. Keith Hartley, who passed in 2011, uh, was a drummer uh, and played with John Mayall for a couple of years and formed the Keith Hartley Band, and the Keith Hartley Band was at Woodstock on their uh, coming off their first album, Half Breed. So they were sort of, of course, sort of a blues-jazz-rock hybrid. Uh, Keith Hartley replaced Ringo in Rory Storm and the Hurricanes when Ringo left to join the Beatles. I know. One, <laughs> yeah, one thing I read was that said he either directly replaced Ringo or was one of the replacement drummers when Ringo uh, left Rory Storm and the Hurricanes and they had to quickly, you know, come up with another drummer. But um, in more than one place, it was mentioned that Keith Hartley was the guy. His career began as the replacement for Ringo Starr as the drummer for Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. So, okay. Wow. Talk about, talk about trivia. Wow. That's amazing, Darren. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. I need a nap. <laughs> Okay, I'll tell you my thing then, which is that okay. uh, not too long ago, I saw some correspondence between Michael Lang, and uh, from, who, I guess, produced the Woodstock Festival, and Apple. Uh, it wasn't one of the Beatles themselves, but it was someone at Apple. And they were talking about Apple having some kind of presence at Woodstock, um, whether it was going to be having, you know, Mary Hopkin and James Taylor and some of the other artists perform. Um, I believe there were, they skated over the possibility of perhaps John and Yoko doing something, or it might have been just sort of 
an Apple booth where they would be able to either advertise or sell the records, something like that. And obviously it never got too far, but there was discussion between Michael Lang and Apple. And who knows if um, it had been pursued on both sides, uh, that would have been sort of another interesting aspect of Woodstock. It could have been John's first post Beatles live performance beating Toronto. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, he had expressed, John, I think, expressed interest in going to the festival. He was having immigration problems. Right. Uh, and that may have played into maybe the whole, may possibly, I'm guessing now, maybe the whole deal falling apart mm-hmm. because of John's issues with the immigration at that point. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, they there was supposed to be some John and Yoko thing that would involve maybe a performance of the Plastic Ono Band in the form of those clear tubes. Right, there was that. Was, you know, with, yeah, that was yeah with music maybe playing or something to that effect. Huh. I can't see any of that working now that we know how it played out, the festival itself. Oh, sure, that would have been... Did you see the lucky guy who was working the Apple booth in the thunderstorm? No. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto was only like a month later, so mm-hmm. you know he obviously had a a yen to do something, and uh, Toronto turned out to be sort of interesting too. That would have been very interesting, and especially if Apple artists were involved, yeah. it could have given a boost to someone like James Taylor. Sure, because mm-hmm. that first album deserved to get a lot more, it really you know, did. success. Yeah. But, you know, do you want to continue along the, the lines of what you were asking before, Alan, about artists connected with the Beatles mm-hmm. at uh, Woodstock? Do you have more? I don't. Okay. I well, don't. I'm, looking, I'm looking at the list here. Why don't you say a few, Darren? Uh, there was um, uh, Rick Danko and Levon Helm from the band was in the first all-star band. They played at Woodstock. Oh, that's well, true. the band uh, also played on the Ringo album. Yes, right, 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 right. And right. George played with the band when he visited Dylan in Woodstock mm-hmm. of which there are bootleg recordings. So it doesn't have to totally count as a non-public event. <laughs> did Nicky Hopkins play? I know he played with John. Did he do anything with Ringo? Oh, sure. He probably did. Cause he played, I think on everyone's records, mm-hmm. Nicky Hopkins was going to be at Woodstock as a member of the Jeff Beck group. They were booked. They were on the posters and a few weeks before the festival, the Jeff Beck group broke up, or you would have Rod Stewart and Ron Wood at Woodstock. Mm-hmm. Nicky Hopkins ended up playing keyboard supporting Jefferson Airplane. Mm. Actually, Nicky Hopkins is uh, one of the few people, along with Eric Clapton, the only two I can think of, of musicians that have played on recordings from each of the four Beatles in their solo careers, okay. as well as playing on Revolution. So... But I also have Shanana here. Shanana was part of the One to One concert. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah, they performed there. Did I know that? I don't know if I knew that. But yeah, that's interesting. That's a good one. I mentioned Edgar Winter before because he performed with his brother Johnny. And then Johnny has the connection with John Lennon for recording Rock and Roll People. Also, you've got all the Beatle connections with Joe Cocker. You know, there's so many of them, of the songs, especially because Joe Cocker covered so many Beatles songs and some solo songs, too. Mm -hmm. But recording something very early and, of course, being so well known for With a Little Help of My Friends at the concert and, you know, the other covers that he did. She came in through the bathroom window. But working with Joe Cocker is another story. So um, just looking at all these here, any that I've forgotten... Um, I'm wondering if um, Chris. Oh well, no, no. Alvin Lee, with Ten Years After. Right. Oh yeah. 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 Work with George. So. Chris Stanton, the keyboard player. I'm wondering now if he popped up on any Ringo sessions or because he played. He was a member of the Grease Band with Henry McCullough, uh, backing Cock Joe Cocker. Um, Richie Havens, of course, has covered uh, covered many Beatles and solo uh, songs. Mm. So that's anyway. another thing. You know, everybody talks about Joe Cocker's performance of "With Little Help from My Friends," but not everybody knows that Richie Havens also performed "With Little Help from My Friends" at Woodstock. And um, 
he even did a medley of Strawberry Fields Forever and Hey Jude. Yeah, he's another one who covered a lot of Beatles songs, you know, throughout yeah. his recording career. Right. Mm. I always I always get a uh, point out, and I know you have as well, uh, Ken, that uh, in the mid '80s on an album called Simple Things, Richie Havens did of all songs, "Arrow Through Me." Yes, I've played uh-huh. that on my show. Yeah. And then did uh, an album called Sings Beatles and Dylan, uh, which was kind of a mixed bag of uh, no pun intended. Uh, was uh, kind of a, a collection of Dylan stuff, solo Beatles, Beatles together, and uh, everything from Rocky Raccoon he covered. And, you know, so Richie Havens has done many. Mm. I know he covered Band on the Run, too. So uh, before, so we could move on to the topic. Uh, one, <laughs> yeah, one thing yeah. I want to ask very quickly, uh, being a, a Woodstock aficionado that I am, I'm just fascinated by the whole thing. And, and, uh, know more about Woodstock than well, well, my own family, probably. What do you think of the museum? And Alan, have you ever been to Bethel Woods? I have not. Okay. And what you can, was your first time? Yeah, it was. Yeah. I was, was there like in 2008 and it blew my head off. Yeah. Same thing with me. It was very emotional seeing this because it's not just about Woodstock. It really covers the 60s in general and all the high points of the 60s and what made it such uh i don't know there's so many cultural changes that happened in the 60s and when you look at the museum you you study all of it you feel it there's so many things going on there at the museum that represented different years of the 60s there's all kinds of artifacts there there's singles with picture sleeves on the wall Beatles singles, Leslie Gore, the Beach Boys, stuff like that. You get a whole feel for the 60s in general. But um, And there's lots of really well-done, very short videos. They're about 10 minutes apiece that they place in various locations there, like in a psychedelic bus, and you're watching it, and then you move on to something else. But um, you really get a, a very deep appreciation of what Woodstock was all about, Because while you can certainly dwell on the music, and that alone was amazing enough, it's everything else around it and what it represented to the generation there. And now you had so many different people, different colors, different races, all coming together. And they all, you know, it was like the different generations of of, uh, people, like the teenagers that wanted to have their hair long, you know, the, the teenagers that wanted to rebel. They were there. And just the fact that, you know, for three days they did this and they were all together. It's such a big crowd of people, you know, at the, the feeling of unity that was there at that time. I don't know if something like that could ever happen again, because you could have great festivals now, as we do still today, like a Bonnaroo or the, you know, the festivals that are on in Europe. And those are great strictly from a musical standpoint but with Woodstock you've got everything else that the 60s were about all tied together with it and um, the young people of that time all coming together for these three days just the fact that it went on all day (laughs) blows my mind you heard music during the overnight and a lot of the new artists of that time were being discovered by this crowd in many ways for the first time you know you had bands like Creedence Clearwater Revival who were new at the time, and even artists who had been around for a couple of years that you heard about, like Jimi Hendrix or so. So many people that went to this festival are seeing these artists for the first time. And the fact that it was continuous for three days blows my mind that that even existed. You know, So many things have been said about Woodstock, and um, uh, just the fact that those three days happened, there was no violence at all. Everybody cared about each other. It's such a wonderful time, and uh, you know, most of my life I've enjoyed the music of it, but here I felt like I really experienced it, going to the museum. And then seeing the Ringo concert on pretty close to the same grounds, it made it so special for me. Yeah, but a handful of the artists who played Woodstock didn't even have an album out at the time mm. uh, that they performed. Santana didn't, Mountain didn't, to name two. Uh, Quill who opened up Saturday's uh, second day, didn't. Uh, Country Joe McDonald had yet to release a solo album. 
Uh, he, of course, was with Country Joe and the Fish. So, yeah, there were all, almost all of those artists were at the very beginning, a lot of them just with one album out. Uh, the veterans were Ravi Shankar and Joan Baez, who right. uh, Joan Baez had had about 10 years of a, being a professional performer and had, uh, I think, over 10 albums out by the time of Woodstock. But uh, anyway, hey, we could do, a, I could do a, a whole show on Woodstock, but. Uh, you did, uh, didn't this you? Is a, <laughs> this, <laughs> This I thought you did three people. whole shows on it. <laughs> when you think about the artists that became iconic, you know, in the years that followed after this this festival, it's, you know, it's mind boggling. The film helped them to some degree. I mean, the, the film introduced us to quite a number of people that we hadn't seen before. I mean, I'd never seen um, 10 years after before. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, and there was a lot, a lot of that in the film. I mean, Richie Havens, I'd probably heard on the radio, but, um, you know, that was sort of a big introduction. Hendrix, you know, Hendrix had already, the, the experience had come and gone by the time of Woodstock. So those three incredible albums he put out with Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding, you know, everybody already had and knew those so it wasn't that much in the beginning of his career in fact he didn't last a lot longer i think he uh, right yeah so um in a way he was you know not not quite as much of an elder statesman or as as joan baez but he was pretty established yeah mountain um wish they were in the film they weren't but yeah yeah woodstock good stuff so shall we turn to um, the the Mark Hudson discussion? Sure. Okay. Um, this was proposed by a reader, and to me, it, it seemed like a pretty good idea at the time. But I think of the Mark Hudson period versus the post-Mark Hudson period, largely in terms of the personnel recording the albums, which I think was moderately consistent during the Mark Hudson period. And once Ringo began producing himself, it was much more um, whoever was around oriented, you know. And lately it's been some of the all-stars which weren't on the Mark Hudson period recordings. Um, but to me, the albums themselves do not sound vastly different. Um, I think the two of you have a different point of view on that. So let's start with Ken. Well, I like to say very often that if you were to ask me what Ringo's best albums have been in his solo career, I would point to Time Takes Time, the first three albums with Mark Hudson, mm -hmm. meaning Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, and uh, Choose Love, not counting the Christmas album, and the Ringo album, too. Those would be like the top five. I look at the albums that were done with Mark Hudson as being, in terms of the quality of the songs, the most consistently strong. And um, Mark Hudson, along with Steve Dudas and Gary Burr and Ringo, members of the Roundheads, they wrote just about all the songs on those albums, uh, not counting Love Me Do and uh, Drift Away. Mm -hmm. And they're all really strong songs. They're all well-crafted. Mark Hudson knows what he's doing. He's a great songwriter, very catchy, very commercial. And some of the best material of Ringo's solo career are on those albums, mm -hmm. without a doubt. I mean, but the, the one problem that I do have with Mark Hudson is that he's a major Beatle fan extraordinaire. And his attitude was, Ringo's a Beatle, you got to scream it. You know, and so much of what's on the Ringo albums really has a Beatles sound to it. And I like that to some degree. I think sometimes it's overdone. But um, in terms of the quality of the songs themselves, they really are strong, consistently strong, song for song. Mm -hmm. There is also a sameness to it at the same time. You know a Mark Hudson production when you hear it. And, um, but at the same time, you take a song like King of Broken Hearts, which I think is one of the best songs in Ringo's solo career. I actually love Ringo Rama the most of those three Mark Hudson albums. And I shouldn't just say that there are three, 
because Liverpool 8, which was the album that followed Choose Love, had Mark Hudson involved in the very beginning, and then Dave Stewart took it over. But um, there's so many really good songs, solid songs, Mm -hmm. on these albums with Mark Hudson. Instant Amnesia is one that really blows me away because it's Ringo letting loose on the drums and doing some soloing, which you're not used to hearing on his records. You know, they're just really strong melodically, uh, but every now and then you hear something where it's very Beatlesque, and I, I think sometimes it was overdone uh, on on these albums. For example, um, I think "Therefore I Rock and Roll" ends very abruptly with Ringo singing that line. It's very much like the end of "Why Don't We Do It in the Road." A song like "Choose Love" has a taxman feel to it. Uh, I know a lot of people were saying that when when the song. Uh, came out but at the same time i mean you can't argue with the fact that the songs are really great you know one of the songs that's also a favorite of mine that i think is one of his best is a song that was kind of not typical of ringo and not typical of the mark hudson period and that's free drinks free drinks is a song that would have fit really well in the uh, early 80s it has a uh, you know a new wave kind of sound I like to point out, if you know Blondie's Atomic, it has that kind of a feel to it. And I'll bet you anything that if you played free drinks to people who have never heard it before, they would never think that's Ringo. And his voice is kind of distorted Mm -hmm. in that particular song. But there's so much strong material on those Mark Hudson albums, very catchy, fading in, fading out, give me back the beat, you know, and uh, what in the world is so Beatlesque. Mm-hmm. Well, but you that's know, what I are, think they were striving for. There are a lot of Beatlesque things, but there's also, I mean, there's also quite a lot that isn't Beatlesque. I mean, a lot of the guitar playing is a lot sort of crunchier than you got during the Beatles days, and um, there are a number of songs that are closer to Boo Coops Blues than to any of the Beatles things he did, even the country, country-oriented Beatles things he did. Um, and, and, you know, and that's the same mix of things that I hear on the post Mark Hudson albums. Um, so, uh, it, it, to me, it never, it never struck me that it was too much Beatlesque stuff because I guess I felt he had the right to that for one thing and Beatlesque stuff. I mean, I just kind of like, and, and it, but it, but a lot of it seemed other than Beatlesque to me. So, it just surprises me that um, I, that I think both of you hear it this way, um, which maybe I just didn't focus enough on on what was Beatlesque, but uh, um, oh. but you know, I mean, it's there. There's such more modern sounding recordings than the Beatles recordings are, and the guitar tone, the kind of playing, a, a lot of that is just something the Beatles would never have done. So, Darren, over to you. Um, yeah, my opinions basically, for the most part, mirror uh, what the two of you have said. When I, I, I always felt that Mark Hudson, was, whether or not he was the perfect right-hand man for Ringo, we'll never know, but was a really, really good one and brought a lot of, uh, figured out how to bring Ringo's strengths to the forefront and how to augment them and put Ringo in the best possible situation. And that came down to songwriting, the whole thing. Songwriting, choice of musicians, choice of guests, presentation of the albums, the whole thing. Mark Hudson did a great job doing that. Everyone loves Jeff Lynne. I love Jeff Lynne. Mm -hmm. But there was a period when Jeff Lynne seemingly was starting to produce everybody, uh, you know, around the Traveling Wilburys period and after when Jeff Lynn was producing a lot of different people from Roy Orbison to Brian Wilson and everyone in between, where it was actually beginning to, at least to my ears, a little tired. It was like, oh, Jeff Lynn produced it. You can be rest assured it's going to sound like the Electric Light Orchestra, and it usually did. I don't think, I think that Jeff kind of shed that. It isn't necessary, necessarily the case in recent years, but there was that period as we went into the nineties where it was that Jeff Lynn syndrome and other producers have done it as well. Their fingerprints are too 
uh, too noticeable on the albums that they're producing. Mm -hmm. T-Bone Burnett in recent years, I felt like after a while, everything was starting to sound like the soundtrack to Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> everything that T-Bone Burnett produced. You know, the drums sounded like pillows recorded underwater and uh, a more contemporary in recent years. I sort of feel that way about Dan Auerbach of the Black Keys. Everything that Dan Auerbach seems to produce has that certain Black Keys thing. Uh, but with Mark Hudson... I felt like he was the perfect uh, or a very ideal uh, right-hand man for Ringo. But after uh, a few albums, there was kitschiness. There was gimmick. There were gimmicks that were all Mark Hudson that was starting to wear thin. Mm -hmm. uh, to my again, this is my opinion. And when I heard uh, that Liverpool Eight was sort of going to be a combination of stuff he did with Mark, and then that sudden out of left field breakup between the two of them. And now Dave Stewart was, at least at that time, stepped in sort of as the new Mark Hudson. Liverpool 8. I was really looking forward to hearing that album when I heard, oh, now Mark Hudson's not there. Let's see what Ringo is going to do now. And Liverpool 8, to my ears, was the first semi-misstep. There were some songs that weren't quite as strong. I think Ringo had put out three dynamite albums in a row vertical man a time takes time yeah but vertical man was really the first all mark hudson thing mm -hmm. and then you had uh, uh the christmas album ringo rama choose love i felt it was a bit of a a slip in song quality with liverpool eight not blaming it on anything more than anything more than just maybe yeah he was due to have an album that had a couple of clinkers in it no big deal but the albums that he's put out since Liverpool 8 have some great songs on them, but it seems like each one has one or two tracks that... Eh. And I didn't feel that way as much with the Mark Hudson stuff. I felt those albums played solid straight through. One song that, that, that jumps out at me is on Why Not. The last song on Why Not, Who's Your Daddy?, Mm -hmm. with Josh Stone as the guest. I remember thinking that really sounded like it was mixed by somebody who was in audio school. I mean, it really sounded poorly put together. I know a lot of people were very skittish with Ringo 2012. Ringo doing so many covers, redoing one of his old songs. The album's 28 minutes long. Mm -hmm. Um it seemed as though Ringo was lacking something. Now, I like Ringo 2012 a lot. That album, to me, works because less is more in that case. I, so I think it's a strong record. But each one, even Postcards from Paradise and uh, Give More a Love, which I think are the best of the post-Mark Hudson albums, there are moments in there where you're like, boy, you know, I feel like that songwriting team that he was working with during those Mark Hudson years was still on board because i don't think that song might not have made the cut or would have had a stronger lyric or maybe more a more involved uh arrangement so i find myself in a way missing mark hudson's uh touch to ringo's albums mm -hmm. well that's where we disagree <laughs> oh you don't uh, miss no, I think it was great for its time, but yeah. I, I like an artist to move on and yeah, no, not I, rely. I, with you. I don't I, like I, artists that rely on the same old formula. No, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I do agree with you. I see what you're saying. And I might say that when it comes to other producers. But, I, you know, it's that case of you sometimes don't appreciate what you have until you've lost it. And I think there was a special chemistry between Mark Hudson and Ringo. Yeah, me that too. Yeah, I think, yeah, he had the gimmicks and he always felt like, and I'm talking about Mark Hudson, he always felt like he had a scream in the background of uh, every song as it's fading out to announce his presence. Or um, there was always a little Mark Hudson thing in there that was like, all right, stop. <laughs> uh, but then it was like there was so many positive stuff that, you know, those albums that Ringo put out benefited uh from from hit that presence and the fact that mark put together a solid team of collaborators musicians and writers and knew what to do uh to to flaunt ringo's strengths 
And Ringo, I think, would be the first to say, I'm not a front man. I'm not a songwriter of the caliber of Paul McCartney. There's nothing wrong with having, putting yourself in with the team that's really going to make you shine. Mm -hmm. He's still shining, Ringo. I just feel like every once in a while it dims and comes back on those on the more recent albums. But like I said, the last two that he put out, uh, Postcards from Paradise and Give Give More Love, I felt were uh, much more consistent than Liverpool 8 to Ringo 2012. Hmm. Well, you see, there, there's so much of what you said there that I, I would say you're spot on. You know, I think that most of these albums post Mark Hudson are not consistently strong all the way through. There's a clunker here and there on almost uh, all the albums. Just, it depends on what you call a clunker. There are songs that, to me, didn't really, really require a lot of effort in writing. Like, for example, on Give More Love, there's a song, Shake It Up, which sounds a lot like Shake, Rattle, and Roll to me. You know, it's very simple, very 50s, few chords, uh, that kind of thing. But at the same time, all of these albums have some dynamite tracks, the post Mark Hudson stuff. In some ways, what I would say is that while the Mark Hudson stuff is more consistently strong in terms of the actual songs, sometimes the post Mark Hudson stuff is more interesting. Because I do like when Ringo writes with different people. And in the case of post Mark Hudson, you've got Dave Stewart. You've got Van Dyke Parks. And I especially like the work he's done with Van Dyke Parks. Walk With You is probably the most, I don't know, mainstream <laughs> of all those tracks. But I like the quirkiness of the songs, the other songs with Van Dyke Parks, especially uh, Samba. I love that one a lot. And Bambula. You know, I love those songs. Richard Marks, I really like the songs he's written with Richard Marks. And Gary Burr, in particular, he's still working with Ringo. He's still writing songs with Ringo. You've got a lot of really strong songwriters. Peter Frampton wrote a song with, uh, with Ringo on the last album, Give More Love, that I like a lot. I do like a lot of the nostalgia-oriented songs, like Liverpool 8, Rory and the Hurricanes, those songs in Liverpool, you know. He wants to do these autobiographical songs. They're okay. Sometimes it's like you've done enough of that. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think that when he does something that's different, like the song Time, for example, which he wrote with uh, Dave Stewart, sounds like nothing else that Ringo's ever put out to me before. It's got a very spacey feel to it, kind of ethereal. When he does something like that, I find it interesting. You know, there's a lot of really good stuff on those albums. But with just about every single album, there's a song here and there where it feels like, you know, they're very simple songs and they were kind of rushed. But still, all these albums have worthwhile material on them. Um, Steve Lukather is another person that he's written with. And the two songs that are on Give More Love, there's a really nice ballad in there, Show Me The Way, as well as We're On The Road Again, which is a kick-ass rocker. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that... He's working with these different people as songwriters because the other songwriters bring out another side to his music. There's something unique about Ringo in that no matter who he writes with, they still sound like Ringo songs. And I think maybe the reason behind that, I know the few times that I've interviewed him, he has said, and he's said this in many interviews, that he's good at starting songs, but he always needs help finishing them. So since he starts the songs off, there's something about it that feels comfortable with Ringo doing it. It's a natural song for Ringo to do. And it's also what the other songwriters bring to those songs that make each one of them different. I like the work he's done with Richard Marks a lot. There's a song called Not Looking Back, which is a really nice ballad. One of the best ballads in his solo career. So, you know, I like the fact that he's working with different people as songwriters. But there also needs to be said... It, it may need to be said that at the same time, I feel like the albums he did with Mark Hudson were for a concentrated period of time, whereas the post Mark Hudson are albums that he recorded at his leisure, you know, at his own home studio. And whoever was in town, he invited on to the next track. And so it would take, you know, a year to two years to complete the next album. It's a different process altogether in doing those albums but i'm glad he's writing with different people every time he's working with someone different you know i embrace that so 
I'm not denying that he was really good with Mark Hudson, but I think that by the time that Choose Love came out and then the work that Mark did on Liverpool 8, it was time to move on. I'm grateful for what Mark Hudson brought, but, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. And, um, you know, I just like hearing Ringo work with different people. One thing that I regretted during the Mark Hudson period was that he had an ensemble, you know, with Mark Hudson and Steve Dudas and Gary Barr that he was very comfortable with and they all played very well together and just I think a couple other people involved in that too and uh, you know as you go from album to album you know you're beginning to build a kind of ensemble rapport and I think that was happening um, it may have been toning down a bit by the time of Liverpool 8 but it might have come up again subsequently and but especially the thing that i miss was i went to both of those shows he did at the bottom line and those were really sort of nicely intimate shows i mean it's almost the same thing i say about mccartney you know the intimate shows are the ones in this case it was they were not only intimate shows but it was with the roundheads who had recorded the stuff and even the stuff that they hadn't recorded together you know like when you know they did beatles things and stuff in the set like a little help for my friends um yellow submarine those were they were fun you know it was just nice seeing him with a group of musicians he was really comfortable with and while the guest spots on the more recent albums are you know okay i mean these are the great musicians stopping by and working with them i i kind of still have a thing about you know a musician with a band you know and uh I think I reviewed Choose Love when it came out. Uh, maybe it was Ringo Ram, I can't remember. Um, one of those in the Times. And at the end of the review, I said something like, you know, he really should tour with these guys. The All-Stars are fun, but, you know, it's kind of like all stars doing their own sets and also backing Ringo and, you know, everyone backing each other. But as a concept, you know, a band playing its stuff. I wish he would tour with the Roundheads. And when I went to the second of the bottom line shows, um, I guess it was uh, David Fishoff, who was managing the All-Star Tours at the time, came up and said, yeah, so Ringo read your review. And I said, oh, yeah, really? And he said, yeah, well, tell him that thing about touring with the Roundheads. Not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got his attention, but apparently uh, it was a non-starter. But I, I think it could have been good. I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, I definitely yeah. agree with you. He also did a show when Shoes Love came out at Irving Plaza with yeah. the Roundheads, and I was there for that one. Mm -hmm. and, and in many ways, I agree with you. You know, there's something there's something special about the chemistry of being in a band and certainly working yourself up to the to the point where you're really tight as a band. And I certainly felt that way with the Roundheads. All you got to do is watch Storytellers, mm -hmm. you know, and you get that feeling that this band really gels very well. And I certainly wish that Ringo had toured with the Roundheads but also because I'd love to see an all Ringo show of all Ringo songs mm -hmm. as opposed to the all star band concept. But at the same time, the songs that Ringo did for the most part with the Roundheads live were the same songs that he does with the all stars, except whatever new songs are on the latest album. Right. You know, there's pluses and minuses with everything. I love the feeling of a band when they're all together and there's chemistry and there's nothing like it. But I like the freedom when an artist is on their own and working with whatever people he feels like. Because mm -hmm. you get another side to them all together that you wouldn't have when you're in a band lineup. I feel that way about groups and, and solo careers in general. Mm -hmm. So that applies to the Beatles too. Okay. Any other thoughts on this, Darren? Mark Hudson did not play at Woodstock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ken? No. Uh, no. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we're kind of, we basically sort of have similar opinions. We just go about getting to that point in different ways. When the dust settles on what I had to say, you know, give me a new Ringo album. I don't really, you know, I'm very, it doesn't have to be produced by Mark Hudson. Right. Um, right. You know. That's basically it for me. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And there also is there also is a sameness in the post Mark Hudson albums that were co-produced by Bruce Sugar. And I like the production on those albums. They're very bright sounding. And I also like how the drums are mixed hotter on his albums in recent years. But like I said, I, I, I enjoy looking forward to every Ringo album just for the, the simple reason that he's writing material, uh, just about every single song on his albums. He's co-writing with someone else. And there's growth in him in that respect as an artist. And um, although I'll never put him in the same category as John, Paul, and George as a songwriter, the fact of the matter is that ever since the Vertical Men album, he's co-written just about every single song on his albums. And that alone makes it exciting for me to explore his music. So, you know, I, I love hearing a song he's written with Steve Lukather. I like hearing a song he's written with Mark Hudson and the Roundheads. You know, I love both aspects, the group and the end on your own. So when you say... Artist. So when you say that, um, you know, the drums are, are sort of sharper and hotter on his recent albums, do you think he's trying to imitate the sound of the Giles Martin remixes of the Beatles stuff? <laughs> I couldn't help yes, it. Yes, he's sorry. getting all that from Giles. <laughs> but, you know, right. I mean, it's a valid point. A lot of his drumming was buried in the Beatles days. That's true. And so now you can mix it up to whatever level you want. Mm -hmm. And I love hearing his drumming. It's yeah. far more pronounced on his recent efforts. Listen to Give More Love. Mm -hmm. His drumming is really sharp on there. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, there's reasons to love both the group aspect and the solo aspect. Okay, so thanks, guys. That was a, an interesting discussion of Mark Hudson and post-Mark Hudson Ringo. You know, actually, I, I brought all these records in to the... Uh, studio uh, studio I used to do this and um, you know it does of course include all those live albums in there but I sort of looked at what I was taking off the shelf and it was you know like three quarters of Ringo's discography um, <laughs> starting in 1989 so now granted also some of these are CD singles and they sort of beef up the pile a little and you know those and the live albums and uh, also photograph very best of Ringo Starr was sort of stuck in there as well, because chronologically, but it's, uh, you know, we're talking about at this point, the bulk of Ringo's work, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a large body of stuff. It's pretty varied. And um, I think I ag agree with what really both of you have said in, in the sense of it's, it doesn't have to be produced by Mark Hudson. I think Mark Hudson did really good work with him. But yeah, whatever comes out, I'm happy to listen to whoever produced it. So why don't we go around, get everyone's contact information and what everyone's up to. And uh, we'll start with Darren. Uh, you can uh, contact me uh, by email, uh, emailing me at WFUV. Uh, the email address is Darren DeVivo. D A R R E N D E V I V O at WFUV.org. I'll be back on the air at WFUV Monday night, uh, August 26th, 10 p.m., uh, after uh, being away for three and more than three and a half months. Uh, and you can go to Facebook and uh, like my radio page which has a long title, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. Click like, and we're connected. Okay. And Ken? Well, before I give my contact information, Darren, you want to let the folks know that your three specials oh, oh, yes. Woodstock is available Thank you. to listen to. I'm going to hire you to be my PR guy, Ken. <laughs> yes, I did uh, three Woodstock specials that aired on uh, the 12th, 13th, and 14th of August on WFUV. They were hour-long specials, parts one, part two, part three. And uh, they are available on demand uh, for a limited time at WFUV.org. So if you're interested and want to check them out immediately once you're done listening to this, and I'm not joking, I mean, because they may not be up for long, uh, go to WFUV.org to our audio and video archive to check out those three Woodstock specials. Okay. Okay, and Ken, how do people get in contact with you? 
Well, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also join my Facebook page, which is simply Ken Michaels. And then there's my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Uh, just recently, I interviewed Mike McCartney because of the new reissue of the McGear album. The interview is available in its entirety with no editing because that's the way that Mike McCartney wanted it. He said, leave it the way it is. So who am I to argue with a McCartney? So it's there on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. There's so many interviews with people in the Beatle world on the website. And then there's my trivia page in which you can win one of nine great prizes every single week. And I will tell you folks that you have an advantage in listening to this show because my trivia question for this week is a Beatles and Woodstock trivia question. And I already gave away the answer right here on this show. So if you listen back to this program about 10 times, you'll probably get the, to know the answer. But uh, check it out, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Don't forget, Talk More Talk is a bi-weekly solo Beatles podcast. It's a video podcast, which you can get on Facebook every other Monday night. The next one will be this coming Monday on the 26th at 9 p.m. Eastern. You can join Ken Womack and Kid O'Toole. And actually, me and Mr. Mayo subbing for Tom Hunyadi. I'm not sure what the next topic will be, but I'm sure it'll be interesting. It's all solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I think that's it. Okay. Well, you can reach me at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed on Facebook. And you can reach all of us by email um, and it's an account where we all can read it so uh, at things we said today radio show at gmail.com kind of a Germanic link there but uh, Steve Marinucci set that up so we're just um, we've inherited it uh, it's again things we said today radio show at gmail.com you can follow us on Twitter at um, at sign things we said fab and we have a facebook page where the new shows are or links to them are always posted once they go up and that is things we said today beatles radio fans so um thanks for listening and for ken michaels and darren devivo i'm alan cozen saying see you next time